Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, really great to see um, so many um, of you, our members uh, here uh, today to join uh, this session. Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, my name is uh, Matt Patton um, and I look after our donor relations um, at the Secretariat for Catalyst 2030. Um, and we're really excited today to have this, our second um, fundraising session in our um, plan series for 2022 and beyond. Um, and just really by way of introduction, just to remind um, you all as members uh, of Catalyst 2030, um, that when we did our strategic evaluation at the end of last year, one of the, um, I suppose, prevailing uh, uh, things that you asked us as a movement to focus on was to be able to help you to develop your own ability um, to fine tune your own fundraising skills for your own social innovation. So this really um, is what the membership uh, has asked for. Um, maybe if we could begin by just sharing um, uh, names, uh, where you come from, um, uh, where you are geographically in the world, that would be really helpful uh, to see where you're all joining us from today. Um, uh, just a couple of um, housekeeping uh, uh, rules. Please try and stay muted, of course, unless you're uh, wanting to speak, which uh, uh, would be enormously helpful. Um, please do, um, if you can, um, try and put your camera on. Um, otherwise, once we hand over to Lisa, it may feel a little bit like she's delivering a podcast uh, rather than a workshop. So please do uh, enable your cameras uh, if you're in a position to do so, so that we can see your uh, smiling faces. Um, and yeah, without uh, further ado, I will hand over uh, to Lisa, who um, really will uh, introduce us. But Lisa joins us today from an organization called uh, For Impact. Um, and Lisa really is uh, passionate um, about public interest work. Um, and I'm sure we'll tell you a little bit uh, about her background now. But I'd like to thank Lisa enormously for joining us today. Uh, and supporting you, uh, our membership, in this way. So, Lisa, thank you uh, once again, and uh, hand over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Matt, um, for inviting me to be here. Thanks to Catalyst 2030. You know, I never for a second take for granted how lucky I am to even like be in rooms with leaders and change makers like this. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. And then everyone on this call, thanks for taking time out of um, what I'm sure is a really packed schedule. I'm really excited to be here. As Matt said, I come from an organization in the US, we're called For Impact. And uh, we help organizations across the social sector tell their stories, fund their visions, and build their teams. Our sweet spot is fundraising. We work with organizations across the sector and around the world, from small organizations to all volunteer, you know, food banks to large INGOs with budgets the size of small countries. We've been around for about 30 years, uh, raised worked with over 6,000 organizations and raised over $2 billion. What I love the most though about the work we do is that in any given year, about 40% of the work we do is with funders. They hire us to work with their grantees. And then the other 60% of the work we do is with organizations out in the field. So I think this gives us a really unique vantage point as it relates to the philanthropic landscape. I was so thrilled when Mel and Matthew approached me about doing this workshop. I understand this is the second workshop in a whole series you all will go through. When I work out in the field as it relates to fundraising, I often receive really tactical questions from the organizations and the leaders I work with. Things like, um, how, how do I transition to an ask? What do I do as a friend? How do I, how do I, um, how do I approach this funder? So when I thought about putting together this hour I have with you all, I thought that I would really focus on tactics, that we would get down into like the nitty gritty of the anatomy of a visit. What I'm gonna share with you all today are the tools and frameworks that the organizations we work with tell us are working wonders out in the field. These tools and frameworks we hear are getting great results. So it's my hope uh, for you all that maybe there's something in here that you'll find useful as you're out there doing the important work that you all are doing. Two quick housekeeping notes before I dive in. Um, first, it's so important for me to share that I am um, keenly aware that I've not walked in your shoes and I do not want to purport to have done so. I aim to be as inclusive as possible. 
if I ever fail in this regard, please do let me know. Uh, secondly, I don't know any of you personally yet, uh, but what I do know to be true is that we can probably all learn a ton from each other. So please, during the course of this hour, feel free to unmute, raise your hand, your digital hand, your real life hand, um, type a question in the chat, share an experience. Uh, as much as we can in this, what seems like never ending era of Zoom calls, if we could just imagine ourselves at a table all together, uh, I think we could really learn a lot from each other. So please feel free to jump in and Mel and Matthew are going to kind of help me monitor that. All right, so the flow for today, I'm going to kick off spending some time talking about messaging. So when we are on a visit with a funder, and I should say right now that throughout the time we're together today, I'm pretty agnostic as to the type of funder. So this could be an individual, this could be a foundation, this could be a corporation, this could even be an impact investor. The tools, the frameworks, the methodologies I'm gonna share with you today, I think work across the board, okay? Now, of course, there's gonna be some nuanced differences in how we approach those different types of funders, but what I'm gonna share with you today, I'm pretty agnostic as to the type of funder. Um, so first, we're going to talk about messaging. And when we're with a funder, how can we um, expertly message what it is our organization does? Second, we're going to talk about the flow of a visit. So once we have that visit with the funder, how are we going to go into it? How are we going to manage the clock? How are we going to get from start to finish? If you could imagine that we're all a sports team and we have a game plan going into a big match or a big game, that's kind of what I think about with the flow of a visit. It is our game plan. And then last but not least, I took some liberties. I said this was going to be the anatomy of a visit. I took a little bit of liberty. We're gonna talk about the few days before a visit and the few days after a visit, because I think that really helps ensure success on the visit. All right, so we're gonna talk about kind of what happens right before and what happens right afterwards, okay? So without much further ado, let's get started on messaging. You're going to be able to tell, I think, in this time I talk about messaging, you're going to be able to tell how passionate I get about, about this subject. I'm, going to, I'm not going to bury the lead. I'm going to start with the biggest takeaway I have around messaging to share with you all. And that's this. Messaging is not what we say, but it's what someone hears. All right? Messaging is not this hour I spend with you today, the message I share with you is not what I say, it's what you guys walk away with, right? So if that is true, and I believe it to be so, our objective is to make it as easy as possible for the funder to hear the message we want them to hear, okay? We have to be real deliberate and real strategic about that. So let me share, if you don't mind, a story to illustrate this point. There is this concept in social sciences called the curse of knowledge, all right, the curse of knowledge is a bias that occurs when an individual communicating with another individual unknowingly assumes that others have the background to understand. Okay, I'm gonna say it one more time. The curse of knowledge is a bias that occurs when one individual communicating with another individual unknowingly assumes that the other person has the background to understand what I'm talking about. So this was tested in the 1990s. Some scientists, some social scientists out of a university here in the US called Stanford University, they ran this big experiment. They brought thousands of people into a lab and half of the people, they said, you are going to be listeners, okay? The other half of the people, they said, you are going to be tappers, all right? The objective of the experiment was to see how often how often the listener could guess the song the tapper was tapping on a table. These were really well-known songs here in the United States, like Happy Birthday to You, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. So the tapper, if you can, I'm gonna put my camera down here, would like tap the song on a table. And they asked the tappers before they started the experiment, how often do you think the listener will be able to guess? How often do you think the listener will be able to guess the song? And the tapper said, I think 50% of the time. On average, the tapper guessed 50% of the time they'll get it right, 50% of the time they'll get it wrong, okay? They ran this experiment over and over and over, many, many iterations. And in reality, the listeners failed miserably. And they were actually only able to guess the song 2% of the time, all right? They were able to actually guess the song 2% of the time. Here's what happens. When the tappers were tapping the song out, they're hearing the tune in their mind as they're tapping. They're hearing the words and the beats and the, you know, the melody and all of that. Meanwhile, all the listeners here are these disparate taps that make no sense, 
All right. And this is the, the article that was written in the in the journal following this experiment. This was a direct quote that I, I want to read because I think it's that I think it's this good. When a tapper taps, it is impossible for her to avoid hearing the tune playing along to the taps. Meanwhile, all the listener can hear is a bizarre kind of Morse code. All right. I read about this. I don't even remember where, but when I read this, it like touched my soul. Cause I was like, this is exactly what happens to us when we're out in the world talking about our organizations and the work we do. We hear all of the background, right? So we know the whole, the whole story. And then we get in front of a funder and they sometimes hear bizarre Morse code. <laughs> so our goal here is to avoid Morse code when we're talking to a funder. We want to paint a clear and easy to understand picture. Okay, so at For Impact, when we when we work on messaging for organizations, we use something that we call an altitude framework. This is a mashup of ideas that are already out there. And a lot of these you have heard before, a bird's eye view, down in the weeds, I'm at a high altitude. So, you know, I'm not claiming we created altitude conceptual references, but what we do is we take those conceptual references and we overlay them on fundraising for organizations. All right, so let me share with you our altitude framing. And I believe in an email that follows this session, this little workbook I'm using, um, or these slides will be sent out to everybody. Okay, so you'll have a copy of this. But we created this altitude framework. We find that funders, in our 30 years of existence, we find that funders, by and large, have three questions of us when we meet with them. They want to know, to what end? Sometimes that's, why do you exist? To what end? The next question they want an answer to is, where does the money go? Where does the money go? Sometimes that question comes out as, what do you do? But they're wanting to know, where's the money going to go? And the last question they want an answer to is, how can I help? OK, so these we find to be the three questions of every funder. To what end? Where's the money go? And how can I help? So what we try to do is, is formulate answers to these questions before we even go into that visit. So we talk about a 10,000 meter message. Our 10,000 meter message answers the question, to what end or why do we exist? We say 10,000 meters because if you can just picture, this is like the view from an airplane. For those of you, I saw how many people are around the world or on this call. We've probably all been on red eye flights. You wake up in the morning and the sun is like just rising. You can almost see like the curvature of the earth. Okay. This is our 10,000 meter message. It answers to what end? Why do we exist? This is the altitude at which we can probably derive the greatest engagement with a funder. All right. A lot of times when we go into a funder visit, they'll say, what is it you do? And something I would encourage you all to think about is maybe responding with, I'd love to tell you what we do. Can I first tell you why it is we do it? Can I first tell you why? We often as leaders in the social sector skip over our 10,000 meter entirely. We skip over our 10,000 meter message entirely and we jump right down to 5,000 or even one meter. I think the reason we do this, you know, I've got a couple working theories. I think probably it's because as leaders, we live down here. And you know that quote, I don't know who said it, but you become what you think about. So I think when we live down here, then we get in front of a funder and it's kind of hard to transition. So a big takeaway I have for you today is don't skip over this 10,000 meter message. It is so, so, so important. Even if you think the funder gets it, and a lot of times they will, right? It's still, a, it's still an opportunity in which to engage at a really deep and authentic level. Quick story to illustrate the importance of a 10,000 meter message. I love sharing this story. There is this remarkable Indian woman named Dr. Reddy. She was born in the late 1800s, I believe. Um, and she was the first female medical school graduate in India in 1912, okay? Lived an amazing life, went on to serve as the first woman on the legislative council in India in 1927. But I'm here today to talk to you about her because she was a master at 10,000 meters. As a young doctor, she had to witness the untimely death of her beloved sister on account of a case of undiagnosed cancer, okay? So um, when India 
becomes independent, one of the first things that she sets out to do is build a cancer hospital. India did not have one at the time. And she wanted to build a cancer hospital and she wanted this hospital to treat patients regardless of their class, regardless of their social stature. Okay. So she goes like probably most of us would thinking that we need government funding for this hospital. So she first goes to the minister of Tamil Nadu and says, I think we need a cancer hospital here. And he says, why a cancer hospital? People only die of cancer. So then she goes to the first national health minister of the country. And he says, we have so many things to do. This is the bottom of that list. So what does Dr. Reddy do? She travels around India on her own to spread a vision of this hospital. And she fundraises on her own through private funds for this hospital. She says, this is not, this hospital is not a place where people go to die. This is a place of hope for cancer patients and their families. And the other thing she says is we are a young country and this is going to be a point of pride for our young nation as we grow legs. This is a place of hope, and this is going to be a point of pride for our country. She was a champion at 10,000 meters. She was able to secure enough funding within a couple years to build this hospital. It is still in existence today. It is called the Cancer Institute. It's a comprehensive center for cancer, 450 bed hospital, a research center, an oncology residency, and still to this day, 40% of the patients treated here cannot afford or do not have insurance. Dr. Reddy understood the importance of a 10,000 meter message. All right, so as we are out there speaking with funders, let us not skip over that 10,000 meter message. All right, the next message, the next altitude I wanna talk about today is our 5,000 meter message. We chose 5,000 meters because this is kind of like if you can just picture a mountain range. All right, so if we are standing on top of a mountain and we're looking down at a village, we can see roofs, we can see sports fields, but we're still pretty high up. This answers the question, where does the money go? Here's the thing we find. If you don't define it, it is going to get away from us, okay? If we don't define where the money goes, it's gonna get away from us. And then what happens a lot of times is funders will hyper-restrict a gift, okay? So let me give you, I told you that my hour with you today, I was gonna try to get real tactical. I would love to give you a tactical idea around a 5,000 meter message we find that it works brilliantly for organizations if they can talk about where the money goes in a group of three, if possible. And let me tell you what I mean by that. There's a ton of research out there that backs this up. The brain loves hearing things in groups of three. We remember groups of three. There's so many examples of this. There's stop, drop, and roll. I came, I saw, I conquered. Papa bear, mama bear, baby bear, small, medium, large. There's all these examples. In the US Constitution, there's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So the, when the brain gets things in groups of three, we like just remember the cadence of it. When the brain gets things in groups of two, we inherently like put things in competition with each other. This is salt or pepper, black or white. There's tons of articles out there about this. So what we did was we tried to kind of take this approach and apply it to fundraising. So years ago, before I worked with Four Impact, we worked with the American Cancer Society. They were fundraising at the time for 64 programs. All right, that turns into bizarre Morse code real quick when we're out there talking about 64 programs. So what we did was we boiled it into three buckets. That was everything we do is to further research medical support for cancer patients and patient advocacy. They could put all 64 of their programs under those umbrellas. And what happens is when we provide that framing to a funder, it just makes a lot more sense. Everything, every layer of detail underneath is fine, but we have the framing, all right? I recently worked with an organization and the challenge that ED was having, the CEO was having was um, giving her board great talking points to go out there and talk about the organization. For her organization, we boiled it down to, this is an organization that um, helps children diagnosed with cancer. And so we went out and said, everything we do is to support the child, the child's family and the community, the medical community. And within each of those, we could talk forever, right? But so it, our 5,000 meter message, if we can simplify it to a group of three, that's amazing. Sometimes we can't, a lot of times we can't, and that's okay too. I don't want anyone to like twist their organization into a pretzel to try to make it a group of three, but I just want to encourage you to think about like an umbrella framing for where the money goes. And then you could kind of go deeper after that. 
All right. One last note on 5,000 meter message and where the money goes. And that's what about overhead? You know, what about our overhead costs? Should that be something that we talk about with funders? You know, my thoughts on that, I get this question all the time. If a funder ever asks me, what is your overhead? What are your administrative costs? Of course, we're ready to answer that question. But, but otherwise, I always fold those costs into our other 5,000 meter buckets. Because without staff costs, without internet, without electricity, we wouldn't be able to do the programs at all. We wouldn't be able to do the scaling efforts at all. All right, so I'm always ready to answer that question, but I would never lead with, you know, we need this much money for our staff costs or for our overhead costs. Okay, and friends, the last um, altitude message, um, the last altitude I want to talk about is our one meter message. Is this if you can just imagine grass or weeds? That answers the question, how can I help? All right, we always want to have an answer to the question, how can I help? We find a lot of times organizations and leaders out there, they'll be in a visit and a funder will say, that, that sounds amazing, how can I help? And a lot of times people will say, can I get back to you? Let me go get a proposal together. Let me talk to my board or let me talk to my CEO. I would love it if you could have an answer right then and there going into a visit, okay? I told you we love the rule of three. So it should maybe come as no surprise to you that our answer to the question, how can I help is threefold. All right, we talk about three ways every funder can help us. Champion, invite, and invest. Champion, invite, and invest. We do a lot of live trainings. And when we're in live trainings, we have the whole room like say it together, champion, invite, invest, <laughs> to get it like kind of folded into everyone's memory. Uh, the thing I love about this framework is is it's really um, flexible. So I'd say, you know, there's three ways you can help us. You can be a champion of our organization. Here's the magic of that word champion. You can use it any way you want. Champion could mean share our social media posts. It could mean write an op-ed. It could mean, you know, A, B, C, D. You could think of a million things. We'd love you to be a champion of our organization. Would you be willing to champion us out there? You're gonna get a yes, all right? You're gonna get a yes. Secondly, invite. This often looks like, uh, you get our organization, you understand the work we're doing, you understand the world we're creating. Do you know of anyone else who should hear about us? Do you know of anyone out there who would be interested in this work? That's kind of an open-ended invite. Or sometimes if we're working with the foundation, right, and we're trying to get to a sister foundation, we could say, look, I know that we are absolutely aligned with the MasterCard Foundation. I'm having a hard time getting there. I know that you guys work in similar circles. Do you think you'd be willing to connect us with someone there? All right, that's our invite bucket. And then last but not least, of course, invest. We've done the math. We know that in order to do this work, it's going to cost this amount of money. Would you be willing to help invest in our work? And I'm going to get to the actual ask in a little bit, you guys. Um, but I just want to introduce the framing right now, the champion invite and invest framing. All right. I hope that that might provide you with maybe just a new way of thinking. Maybe you try it out. Maybe you just put it in your back pocket for later, but we do see this working wonders and we hear feedback that, um, you know, we're out in the field ourselves using this and, and we find that it works quite well. Here is the most important thing about altitude framework. And it's that we need to have altitude awareness. People are going to engage at an altitude of our choosing, all right? This is a conceptual reference. You need all three, all right? There's not one altitude that's better than the other. I just want you to have command of which altitude you are engaging at. I want you to have command and control over which altitude you're engaging at. I do not scuba dive, but I know that for people who scuba dive, when they come up too quickly, they get the bends. And I know that's bad, right? So what we find with messaging in visits with funders, it's actually the opposite of the bends. And we find that leaders often go down in altitude too quickly. All right. Now, a funder might ask us a question that's a one meter question, and I would encourage you to answer that. But then I would probably come back up to your 10,000 meter message to make sure we hit all of them. All right. Um, so have altitude awareness. Know at which altitude you're speaking. A quick story from the field, um, an organization I currently work with had a visit in the last six months with a mega funder, one of these philanthropists that we read about uh, in the headlines every week who's giving away billions. And this 
this funder had deputized six people to meet with organizations to, to distribute money from his fund. And so I'd been working with this organization for a few years and we had this visit, we were so excited. The executive director used the altitude framework. We already have their 10,000 meter message, their 5,000 meter message, their one meter message done. We've been doing it for a couple of years now, but she presented at altitude to this deputy. And at the end of the call, he said, thank you so much for this presentation. I do six calls a day and I often hang up wondering what the organization does and what they need our help for. And this was so clear and simple and easy to understand. This was a remarkable difference from the visits I usually sit at. All right, so we can always add layers of nuance and layers of detail, but let's start simple and then add on, okay? If we were in person right now, I wish we were, maybe one day we will be, and, and I could give you a paper book, like a paper workbook, you would see this page and then across the way you would see this. So just bear with me for a second. It, when we are developing our 10,000 meter message, I want to encourage you all to think big. All right, how can we really solve this problem? What is our moonshot? Okay, when we are thinking about our 5,000 meter message, I want you to build simple. Start as simple as possible and then simplify again. Right? We can always add layers of detail as we get in conversation with the funder. And last but not least, when we are thinking about our one meter message, I want you to think about acting now. In our live trainings, we often hand out, let me see if I can get this, we often hand out these draft stamps. And we encourage organizations to throw a draft stamp on everything you do. We are learning organizations. We should be working in draft form almost all the time. What I don't want anyone to do is to wait until they have their message exactly perfect until they have their ask exactly perfect, until they have their strategic plan for the next two years strategically perfect, absolutely perfect before we get out there. All right, the time is now, we need the funds now, the need is now, so let's get out there and act now, all right? So that is altitude messaging in a nutshell. Um, one last point I really wanna make um, before, I, before I continue on is when we are going through a visit and when we are talking about our organization, one of the most important things we can do is engage the person with whom we're speaking. All right, one of the most important things we can do is engage. This is not a pitch. We're not sitting there, you know, just talking at them like I'm actually doing to you all right now. So this is a <laughs> do as I say, not as I do moment. <laughs> um, we want to engage funders. Our definition of engagement is the dynamic within a relationship that holds attention, heightens interest, and motivates action, okay? So what's the best way to engage? The easiest way is to ask questions, all right? We often prepare as many questions for a visit as we do talking points. Ask questions throughout. And here's the harder part of asking questions, at least for me, that is listen to answers. <laughs> Sometimes I'll ask a question and while the person is speaking, I'll be thinking about my next point. So we want to get the funder speaking. This does two things. One is it creates in them some personal discernment. All right. So if you can picture yourself in university sitting in a class uh, and a professor is just speaking, like it's just happening to you, you're in receive mode. But once you start talking, you start to think about how do I fit into this problem and solution? All right, we want to create in the funder personal discernment. We want them to see how they fit into this. The second thing it does is it brings them fully present the second they start talking. All right, I suspect if I asked you guys right now, um, who in this room has had their mind wander since I started 32 minutes ago, I suspect 100% of you would say, oh yeah, at some point my mind wandered. I thought about my kids or my inbox or a grant application I have due. Let me tell you that in the last 32 minutes, my mind has not wandered once because I can't think about other things while I am talking to you all. So if we're engaging a funder, asking questions, getting them talking, they're going to be immediately present, okay? Quick rule of thumb um, for a visit, if we're gonna talk 2X, if we can get that funder talking 1X, okay? So for every 2X that we talk, we want them to talk 1X. All right, so we wanna really, in a 60 minute call, it'd be great if we're talking for 40 minutes and they're talking for 20. Just keep that in mind. I don't want you with a stopwatch or anything like that, but just keep that in mind as a general rule of thumb. We see that working really well. Other ways to engage funders are to use visuals, to share an experience, to bring in a beneficiary or a board member into the call. Just different ways you can kind of make it anything but a pitch. 
All right. Okay. So from here, and I have not really checked the chat too much lately. If there's any questions. Oh, great guys. Thanks. I don't see any questions. You guys are awesome. If there is any that I'm missing, please anyone unmute and slow me down. You can tell that I uh, get going <laughs> pretty quickly. All right, let's talk about that game plan for the visit. All right, so let's pretend like we are a soccer team or a football team for everyone who's not in the US, which I think is most of you. So let's talk about our football team and what we are going to do going into a visit. This, I think that works okay. This is our presentation flow, okay? Oh, great, I see a question. Go ahead. Uh, Hi, Lisa. Yeah. Um, so my question uh, to you is, can you give us an example of what kind of engaging questions we can ask uh, to begin, uh, to have their interest from the beginning of the conversation? Yes. Just, uh, just some examples. Yeah, I love the question. Thank you so much for asking it. So, you know, if you're talking about from the beginning of a presentation, it might be as simple as, thank you so much for taking the call. I'm sure you get a lot of requests. Do you mind my asking, like, why, what about our organization led you to agree to take this call? Or did you, did you, you know, what do you, do you mind my asking, like, what do you know about, you know, micro loans in Rwanda? Do you know much about it? Another great question is always just as you're talking, you can stop and say, does that make sense? It's such an easy question, but what it does is it gives the funder a chance to kind of echo back what they heard. And then it gives us a chance to correct the record, you know, to correct it if they're not hearing right. Another example, one of my very favorite questions I see working magic uh, multiple times a week, I work with this incredible organization um, that provides reproductive health education to adolescent girls in Kenya. Okay, and they have a really innovative education model. They use these awesome comics. I usually have one sitting by, of course I don't right now, but they have these beautiful comics that have been drawn by this illustrator who worked with girls and just really incredible stuff. So we always ask funders, would you mind my asking, when you went through reproductive health education or sex education when you were young, what was it like? And with <laughs> without fail everyone cringes and they're like oh it was the worst it was like super awkward my teacher was really weird we had this like black and white textbook and it was just like even now thinking about it makes me like shudder and so it's like such a great engaging question that gets people thinking where we say yeah exactly and it it's not a great way to educate youth so we've created this this innovative way to do reproductive health education so there's some really neat customized ones you could do pursuant to what your organization does so Lisa, what I really liked about your answers were that from the beginning, you created a sense of ownership within the funders uh, to even, you know, begin you before you start the discussion, yeah. you're asking them the right questions that why, are, why would you like to interact with me? I really like this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. I love it. This is awesome. I love talking about this stuff. All right, guys. So let's get to the flow of the visit. Um, I want to share something with you for probably most, probably some of you in this room, you're going to say, as my kids would say, duh. And then for the other, some of you in this room, you might think this is really eye-opening. But I want to talk about the open of a visit. This is something that's not talked about very much. When we do live trainings, we, um, we pair people up. And what we tell them is person A, you work for your organization. Person B, be yourself, but with money, <laughs> which is always fun for person B. And what we say is pretend like you're doing a funder visit. You've got 10 minutes and they do the visit. And then we switch partner A and partner B. Okay. Most of the time, 90% plus of the time, when they do this exercise, the pairs do not spend any time on an open. They jump right into what the organization does, what they need, kind of goes into like radio mode. We turn into robots. You know, I come to you today from Four Impact. We help organizations across the sector tell their stories and fund their visions. 40% of the work we do is with funders. Instead of just saying, hi, I'm Lisa Corcoran. I'm really happy to meet you. I didn't do too much Google stalking because I wanted you to tell me a little bit about yourself. Could I hear a little bit about what led you to work for this foundation? What is it about girls and women's empowerment that really led you to, to follow this career path? It's really important that we take time to do this and then share a little bit about ourselves too. What we do is 
in trainings, we then send the partners back out and say, do it all again, but this time spend some time on the open. <laughs> and without fail, they come back telling us they felt so much calmer and less nervous by the time they got to talking about their organization. So quick note, just don't skip over the open. Um, like I said, some of you are gonna say, duh. Um, and some of you are gonna say, oh, wow, I should stop being a robot and I probably should spend time on that. So a quick way to think about the open, maybe talk about you, talk about the org, and then talk about us. So as we transition to us, it would be something like, well, I was so thrilled to see that you're interested in, in helping alleviate world hunger. This is exactly what we do. Would it be okay if I talk to you about what our organization is doing in that regard? So we kind of are shifting from that open, get to know you down to like where we're starting to talk about the work the organization does, okay? Um, from here, what I often, we talk about here is a point where we are going to ask for permission to proceed. And we are also going to do that down here. Let me tell you what I mean by that, permission to proceed. After we do the open, would it be okay if I share with you the work it is that we're doing, or if I share with you why it is we're doing this work? I'm kind of signaling or foot stomping, if you will, that I'm going to start to talk about the organization. I then typically pull up a visual, right, when I start to talk about the organization. All right, so when we get to start to share the story, you heard about the 10,000 meter message, the 5,000 meter message. So we're going to share those engaging throughout, okay? We're sharing this, but we've got those questions throughout, all right? Our goal is to get to, wow, this is awesome. How can I help, all right? How can I help? Now, here's a pro tip. If we don't get to a point where a funder says, wow, awesome, how can I help? What, me, what we might think about saying is, would it be okay if I talk to you about how you can help, all right? Would it be okay if I talk to you about how you can help? That's our permission to proceed to the, to the one meter message. This is our one meter message down here. We are going to present the opportunity. You guys heard me talk about that champion, invite, and invest. So when we get down to our one meter message, how can I help? We're going to talk about champion, invite, and invest. I want to draw your attention to something real quickly. Here, this very deliberately says present the opportunity. I don't think I can highlight or underscore that enough. When we are out there meeting with funders, I do not want us to think of ourselves as asking for money or worse yet, like begging for money. I do not want us to have the visual that we are kind of like arms outstretched, hoping to keep operations running. We truly, this is not just words. I believe this in my heart of hearts. We are presenting the funder the opportunity to join us in the impact we are having. All right, yes, they have funds that we need no doubt about it. But yes, we have impact that they need. I told you we work with a lot of funders. Believe it or not, the number one pain point we hear from the funders that we work with is actually having an impact with their philanthropic investments. That's true of the foundations we work with, of the individuals we work with, and of the CSR from corporations we work with. They want an impact. So this presenting the opportunity, can you think of it as a partnership where you are standing shoulder to shoulder, looking out across the horizon, at whatever cause you work on, all right? This is a true symbiotic partnership. So we are presenting them with the opportunity, okay? We are presenting them with the opportunity to join us in our impact, okay? Okay, so I told you I was gonna get into brass tacks today. I'm gonna get deep in it. I wanna share a few asks and I wanna share a resource with you all. We're doing well on time. Let me just check that. Okay, great. We're doing great on time. So I'm going to share with you a few asks that you might use, or maybe this will just spur you to think about a different way you might ask for funding. So let me share with you this great resource that I listen to all the time. Okay, there we go. Down here. This is like a 90 minute audio of 15 different closes, all right? It's, it's publicly available and this will come out to you. So no need to jot it down right now if you're, if you're following me. Um, this is going to come out. These are 15 different closes that we use all the time at For Impact. I want to share just a couple with you today just to get you thinking. I told you we've raised $2 billion over the years. Over half, no doubt, over half of that $2 billion has been done with the clueless close. This is a great close 
um, when we're not really quite sure what the ask should be. And it takes a lot of the pressure off the person going in to, to request funds. So what happens is we're going to lay out our funding needs. We've done the math to do this project, to launch this initiative, to scale to South Africa, whatever it may be, we know it's going to cost X amount of money. I'm not sure what your capacity is, or I'm not sure what you're able to do, but would you partner with us in this effort? I'm not sure what you're able to do, but would you consider joining us in this effort? Sometimes you'll see like a funding pyramid or a funding chart that will say something like, we're looking for one funder at fill in whatever money you want there, two at this, three at this. And sometimes we show that to a funder and we'll say, here's what we need to accomplish, A, B, or C. And we might say, I'm not sure what your philanthropic capacity is this year, but if you could partner with yourself, with us, where do you see yourself in this chart? And it just starts a conversation. All right, so that's the clueless close. This works wonders and, uh, you know, orgs that we work with use it all the time and, and come back and tell us that it's working. Another great one that we like is the handful of people close. Uh, you know, this works really well if we have a few people, a few corporations, a few foundations who can help us achieve our funding goal. And it goes like this, we're going to share the need like I just did. Um, you know, we, we know that it's going to cost this much. We are looking for three lead investments at whatever that amount might be. There are only a handful of funders I can ask to be part of this lead group. Would you be willing to lead us in this effort? All right, this is a great close when we truly do have a handful of people and when we know that that funder likes feeling special and needed and a little bit um, distinguished, if you will. That's the handful of leaders close. Um, one last example I wanna share and you guys can listen to all of these. Um, so I don't wanna belabor the point here, but another one that we see great success is this contingency close. The contingency close goes like this. Um, we ask for funds contingent upon something else. So we are in the process of formalizing an MOU with the Kenyan Ministry of Education. Once we have that MOU finalized and once we're working in Kenyan public schools, could I come back to you and talk about leading us in this scaling effort across the country? Now, I wouldn't do this contingency close unless we were pretty close to doing what I think we're gonna do or what I say we're gonna do. All right, another time we just did, I just did this recently. We are in talks with the foundation to underwrite a large portion of an RCT, of a randomized control trial. Once we secure that funding, can I come back to you and talk about filling the gap? We're still gonna have a $100,000 gap, all right? So these are a few closes that you might think about using or tweaking, of course, for, for whatever works for your organization and your conversation you're having with the funder. What I would advise against and what I see happen a lot out in the field is what I call kind of like the dot, dot, dot close. And that kind of looks like this. We're doing all this great work. Isn't it amazing? Dot, dot, dot. Or sometimes you can even take it a step further, which is like, we're doing all this great work to continue doing it. It's going to cost, you know, 100,000 US dollars, dot, dot, dot. And then that's the end of the call. All right. I want us to drive towards an actual ask. All right, and how do we know it's an ask? Because we expect a yes or no answer. We're with the funder, preferably one-on-one -on -one or one-on-one -on -one over Zoom is just fine. So I wanna try to avoid this dot, dot, dot close where we're asking the funder to kind of draw the conclusion of what we need. Let's tell them what we need, let's simplify it. Let's get that one meter message down, Pat. All right, in the materials that are gonna come out after our session today is this ask checklist. So I'd encourage you um, to take a read through, it's just a couple bullet points, but what we find is that a lot of times visits are scored as asks when there really was no ask made, okay? So we'll work with orgs and they'll say, we're doing all these visits, but we're not raising enough money. We're doing all these visits, but we're not raising enough money. And um, what we do is we then look, were you actually making an ask? So this is a checklist for you to work on and see if you think you're making an ask. I want to share, I don't think you need to make an ask with every single visit, all right? Um, there's going to be times where it's going to take two or three visits, and that's part of your strategy, but I want you to always be thinking about driving towards that ask, 
All right. One quick, you know, I'm kind of giving you like the logistics around these closes, but if I can give you like a mental mind trick that seems to work for a, a lot of organizations, you know, a lot of us don't feel comfortable fundraising. We get nervous, we get sweaty palms. Um, we feel like we're kind of unnatural doing it. I'd encourage you um, to think about this trick that we call the last investor. All right, the last investor. If you were meeting with your last investor, the one person, the one corporation, the one foundation standing between you and having to shut down your operation, what would you do? How would you approach that visit? Would you do a dot, dot, dot close? Would you say we're doing all this great work, dot, dot, dot? Or what would you do to ensure viability? If we can approach every funder visit with that same mentality, like this is our last investor, this is our last shot, I think there's a really great chance you're gonna see good results out of that. All right, so that's just kind of a little bit of a mind trick that may or may not work for you, but I share in case it does. Okay, how are we doing on questions? Are there any, let me just check the chat and then I'm gonna keep on going. Uh, can you can have recording? Okay, good, thanks guys, nothing nothing there. All right. So of course, we've got 10 minutes to go, which makes me sad because I like talking about this stuff and I like being with all of you. I told you that we were going to um, go outside of, I called it the anatomy of the visit, but give me a little bit of liberty. We're going to kind of go to the right and left of the visit a little bit. What should we do in the few days before a visit and what should we do in the few days after a visit? All in an effort to maximize that funder relationship. All right, what do we do immediately before to set us up for a great visit? And what do we do after to set us up for closing the gift, okay? So before the visit, we I would encourage you to think about doing what we call predisposition. Predisposition is anything and everything we can do to make it not a cold call, okay? Anything and everything we can do to make it not a cold call. This usually takes the form of an email a couple days before a visit. We'll send a few days out. And what we wanna do is we wanna predispose to the impact or the cause that we're working on, the team, who's gonna be there. And you guys, I think this is the most important. We're actually gonna predispose to the ask. And you know, the way this often looks is, um, you know, I, I, I kind of close out emails, like I'd love to share more about what we're doing and explore ways in which you might help. I'd love to share with you our 2023 initiative and see if maybe we could and see whether we could be invited to apply for a grant next year. I actually let the funder know before that there's going to be an ask. It takes a lot of the pressure off. And then also the funder shows up to the call ready to talk about it. Uh, you know, a predisposition, I told you it usually takes the form of an email, but I'd encourage you all to get creative when you're predisposing. You might send a video, you might attach hyperlink to an op-ed. Um, sometimes you might even pull someone else in to do your predisposition, maybe your board chair. You know, if, if, if they have the board chair has a connection with the funder, perhaps they're sending the predisposition out. All right. I talked about altitude framing vis-a-vis -vis the visit, right? That we're going to hopefully start with our 10,000 meter message, eventually flow down to our one meter message. I'd encourage you all to think about altitude framework even when you're writing your emails. Okay, so maybe start with your, in your email, start with your 10,000 meter message. You know, we exist to ensure that all children in Lesotho um, are treated for HIV AIDS and malnutrition. We do this in three ways. You know, we, we have outreach vehicles, we have a safe home and we have community um, health training. And you can talk about each of those as needed, but I would also think about including that altitude framing within your predisposition, okay? We're then gonna get to the visit. We've talked about that. Um, the last, the only other thing I wanna share on visit in this short time we have is, and I suspect most of you are doing this, but I wanna just um, underscore the importance of really strategizing a visit before we go in there. Think about what would it mean to maximize this relationship? What am I gonna say if a funder says, how can I help? What am I going to say if a funder says I can't right now? Um, think through various scenarios so that we show up ready to go. All right. I often do a lot of scripting for visits. Um, I don't always follow the script. In fact, I rarely follow it as I, as I scripted it, but I'm mentally ready to be there and to be driving towards that funding conversation. Okay, so we're gonna do the visit. And then the third thing we're gonna do, you guys, is follow up. Um, you know, this 24-hour rule. 
I think imperfect follow-up within 24 hours is far better than perfect follow-up six days out. We wanna keep that momentum alive and we wanna keep the ball in our court as much as possible. So if during a visit, a funder says to you, this all sounds great, I need to um, go talk with the corporate board. I need to speak with the, you know, with the program officer at the foundation, or I need to speak with my wife. You know, I'm trying to think of all scenarios. Um, what I would encourage you all to think about is completely understand that sounds great. Would it be okay if I email you, if I follow up in three weeks? So we wanna keep that ball in our court so that we're the one kind of pushing forward, okay? Even though we'll email in three weeks, we're still gonna do that follow-up the next day. It was, the conversation was great. Love talking about this and this. You know, as I said, I'll follow up in three weeks after you've had time to talk to your corporate board about whether there's room in your CSR this year. All right. Um, follow-up, I wanna think about following up in three ways. First, with the funder, we've talked about that. I want you to think about following up within your own organization. So what are you doing within your own systems and processes? Where are you capturing your own notes from that visit? Okay, because I probably think in six months, 12 months time, you're not going to remember what was said on that visit. And last but certainly not least is follow up with yourself. A lot of um, some of the best fundraisers we work with keep a little notebook, you know, a professional development or things that they keep where they're saying this went well, this didn't go well. I felt, you know, great when I did this so that we're kind of constantly improving our own um, ability to do this work. You know, throughout predisposition, visit and follow up, I want you to always remember the goal to keep engagement high. So anything we can do that's engaging, we want to keep that engagement high. We do not want the funder to be in receive mode the entire time. Woo, you guys, I wanted to save a couple minutes for questions if we have any. And um, so let me stop there and see if anyone wants to jump in, to unmute or put in Slack, in, Slack, <laughs> in chat if you have any questions at all. There's a couple in the chat, Lisa, already. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. How much detail should the predispose include? Like the whole story, what and how? Like, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. It's an awesome question. I would say um, as little detail as needed. <laughs> How's that for, <laughs> for a non-answer? It's not helpful to you at all. Um, we want the person to read the email. Okay, so you know, I know, we all know when you open an email that's too long, it just becomes too hard. And we usually like go on to the next. So I would say as, as little detail as you need just to convey your, your, a little bit about your organization, a little bit about the team who will be on the call, or maybe even just you, right? I founded this organization or I joined this organization last year and then a little bit about predisposing them to the ask. Okay, thank you very much. Sure, thanks for the question. Can I share PowerPoint? Okay, good, that's going. And oh, you know, and I really wanted to tell you guys, um, I wanted to tell you guys um, that I'm gonna throw in the chat now. And it's also, by the way, on the front of, um, it's also on the front of the workbook. Oh, great, Dana, Dana, I'll get to you in just one second. Our website for impact.org has a tab in the upper right-hand corner called Learning Library. Everything we do is on there. Every methodology we use, every approach, there's videos on there, there's blogs on there, there's worksheets on there. It's more than you could ever want. It's almost disorganized. Um, so jump in there in all the free time you have um, and, and take a look if you're interested in any more of this. And furthermore, my email is on the front of the, the slide. So anyone reach out anytime. I love talking about this stuff. Okay, is it Dana? Did I say that right or wrong? Yeah, that's perfect. It's Dana. Thank, thank you me. very much. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very, very valuable. I just have one question about a topic we did not cover, and it's uh, how useful do you think it is for us to attach into the first email our pitch deck? Oh, because yeah. as you were mentioning, like the email should be short, and that's what we try to do. But we also we also attach our pitch deck as like a, I don't know, like a first insight of what we do. Yes. What do you think about that? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question, Dana, I love it. You know, it's gonna depend on the funder, but I would say most funders 
I probably would not attach a pitch deck first time through. Now, if it was one that already knew you well, or let's say there's a funder out there, I'm going to just pick a foundation. I'm thinking of a foundation that's very data driven. I know this to be true because they talk about it all the time. Um, maybe I would attach some like some slides around our data, right? Like, so in that case, I would because there's a really um, there's a really valuable reason for it. But my goal, my I'm always trying to engage the funder as much as possible. I want to bring their engagement from a one to a ten. So I would say looking through your pitch deck, looking through your slides is probably an engagement of a one. Hearing you talk about it and you asking questions of them as you're talking, that's an engagement of a nine. So I would say if the first time they're hearing about your work, it's from you and you're engaging them throughout asking, what was, what was your you know, reproductive health education like? Or um, do you have kids? Do they like to read comics? That's going to bring the engagement way up. So that's our first um, shot at them. Now, if you want to send that in follow-up, sure. But they've already heard it from you, and they're going to be that much more connected to you in the mission. Does that make sense? Absolutely, Lisa. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Great question. I love it. I love talking about this stuff. And by the way, you guys, I hope that um, you get this from me. There's like, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for almost anything as it pertains to fundraising. I think there's a thoughtful answer. <laughs> so my hope for you all is as you're out there trying to raise money for the incredible work you're doing, that you're just thinking about it before going out there and you're being strategic. And if there's a reason for, you know, attaching a, a slide deck or not, or um, you know, bringing a, a beneficiary into the call or not. Like we never really know if what we're doing is exactly the right way, but just being thoughtful about it, trying to engage, trying to connect, um, forming that personal connection, thinking about that symbiotic partnership. If we're doing that, um, then I think we're already, you know, eons ahead of where we could be. All right, Mel, Matthew, is it okay? Um, is it okay if I take another question or do you guys need to end it? Yeah, is no, sure. We've got time for another. Okay, great. Is it Smriti? Am I saying that right? Yeah, hi, this is Smriti. Uh, sorry, probably I have a couple of more questions. So um, if we are, uh, you know, writing an email, we are doing a cold, cold call email where we are writing to a prospective funder for the first time. It's a very introductory call, mm -hmm. uh, introductory email. So, uh, because we have to keep it very small and we have to do the messaging, as you mentioned, what, you know, can you give us some tips over that as well? Or, yeah. or you know, probably this is not the right platform to ask that. I mean, you can let me know. <laughs> no, this is great. I appreciate the question. It's definitely outside the scope of like what I was trying to do today. I was trying to really narrow in on once we get the visit, but you know, your question is a great one. What do we do with a cold call? Or the question I thought I would get today is like, how do we find funders? That's the question I get um, 27 times a day. Um, you know, cold emails are really hard. If I can just give you like a really quick answer, it would be try not to make it a cold email. It's like, look far and wide in your network. Like, is there anyone that can connect you? Is there anyone that can do anything? And it might not be as close of a connection as you think, right? Um, but I do a lot of work. I'm really lucky. I do a lot of international work fundraising. And so I work a lot with, with governments in other countries and we'll get a government representative who sees the value of our work to email a foundation that he or she does not know, but it's coming from an email at kenya.gov, right? And so it's more likely to be opened. So if we can make it not a cold email, I mean, I guess it's still cold because they don't know them, but there's just a higher likelihood of getting that opened, okay? Or who else in your world can you use? And then if it is a true cold email, we're gonna have to do that from time to time. Um, just bring your engagement up as high as you can. So can you attach a video? Can you attach an op-ed? Maybe it's not an email. I have seen magic work with sending books and with an inscription. If there's any book, and it's not a book you wrote, don't get me wrong, it can be a book about the cause you're working on. Can you send a book with an inscription? Can you send a note? That's a great way to get a visit. Um, but I wish I could do more. I could talk about this forever. Um, and maybe even email me if you want, and we can talk a little more offline. Um, sure, uh, Elisa, I think this is another scope of workshop for us. <laughs> Thank you for that. Maybe, yeah, I'm sure. Maybe tell Matthew and Mel. Yes. <laughs> and I think that segues nicely into the close of the session. We're at the top of the hour. Um, 
Lisa, what can I say? Absolutely fantastic. I think you've seen some of the comments uh, in the chat already. Thanking you for this great and valuable presentation, pitched perfectly, um, practical, um, enormously helpful. Um, I've been fundraising for 25 years and I've learned some new tips and tricks here as well. So I'm really looking forward to taking some of those forward into my own practice for Catalyst 2030. And um, thank you for everyone that's been able to join us today. Really great turnout. We will be sharing um, Lisa's workbook uh, with you, I think, as you as we agreed at the top of the session uh, tomorrow in an email. We'll also send a very, very short survey monkey um, for questions asking what you thought of the session and what you'd like to see in future sessions. So I know there's a bit of conversation around that. So please, please, I encourage you to fill that in because these sessions are for you um, as our members. Um, and so we want them to be as helpful um, as possible uh, for each of you. So, um, yeah, without further ado, Lisa, thank you once again for a really thoughtful um, and inspirational session. Um, and I'm sure everybody will uh, join me in that sentiment. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Great to see uh, all of you. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, hearing from you and seeing you at our next session, which we'll be advertising very soon, but should be coming up um, in October, November time and we will share that with you in the usual channels. So thank you again, Lisa. Thank you all. Thanks for filling my cup today and thank you all for the amazing work you do. Take care. <laughs>